to implement a virtualized system or uh, infrastructure as a service. This whole model gets out the window. There's not even a risk assessment done most of the time. Let me give you some examples. Confidentiality, yeah? Do we actually think about who's actually accessing the data now? Or, or, or who should be accessing the data? I don't think we do. The integrity of the data. We all open up our iPads now or log into a system into Salesforce or some virtual world and we believe the data. You know, it's that bad. We look at Facebook and become, because someone's requesting to be our friend, we actually believe they are our friend in real life. And we start communicating with them. It's crazy. Let me give you an example of an integrity attack. Uh, many years ago, a very large online organization had an integrity attack. Their, the administration password for the backend database was compromised, and one particular product item was changed. It was changed from $90 to $9. In the end of the month, their ERP systems kicked in and placed a new stocking order, not for a couple of thousand, but for many thousands, because the sales were going through the roof. At the end of the quarter, they couldn't believe it one of the fastest selling products ever in the history of online sales. It wasn't until six months later that they realized they made the biggest loss as well. And that was an integrity attack. Availability, virtual broadband. Everything is connected to our IP. We have management systems for our web browser. The days of going up and plugging our serial cable in now are kind of gone. I don't know if uh, many of you know what the serial cable is. But you can actually disable systems now very easily as well. And then you've got accountability and auditability, which are kind of really, really important. I know mean, a lot of virtual world and online applications, it's kind of for go back. Another real life example I was involved in, I was brought in to be an expert wit witness for the National Health Service of England. Uh, an individual was caught down over the pedophile material. They called it bound to rights. It went to court, however, the Crown Prosecution Service dismissed it, and the individual got his job back. The reason they dismissed it was the actual logs showed that there was five other instances of a user logged in using the same username and password. So even though they called him, the log files could not back it up with the evidence. So the accountability and the auditability. And essentially, we've forgotten about these basic principles. And if we start thinking about implementing and doing some of these basic principles, it will be a lot safer, a lot easier. And it doesn't have to be technical either. So we've kind of gone through this number, you know, like three generations of what I call the kind of hacking generation. The first era was a, I used to have a 386 computer, and several of them, with modems connected. I would be doing war diving against PBX phone systems. And I'll be looking for a particular term called 2600. It was kind of really slow. It took a long time. It would take maybe two or three weeks to actually compromise an organization. But we did it successfully. <coughs> then we kind of moved on to kind of not using the modems, but using broadband, ISDN, etc., etc., and being more connected to the world. <coughs> so then the browser actually became a hacking tool. And in some cases, still is. So you type in certain commands into Google, which I'll show you later, or into your web browser. You can actually compromise organizations. But the first stage and the second stage are kind of really hard. Well, it doesn't need to be hard. All we have to do now is compromise the user's password. How many of you have more than five passwords? How many of you use the same password in your personal life and in your business life? It's the same, yeah? How many of you link your password to you personally? Your mother's maiden name, your pet's name, your child's name, your hobby. See? It's really easy. So, the problem we've got now, we've got this hybrid model going on. You're mixing your personal life and your business life. And if I was to compromise your personal life, I could compromise your business life. A real life example, and go and try it. Don't blame me, but make sure you do it, you know, you may want to do it against your wife or 
whoever, someone you know with that permission. Go on to Google or any of their Hotmail accounts or uh, web, web accounts or any online account. Click on the forgot password. In most cases, you get a secret answer come up or a secret, sorry, a secret question appear. What's your favourite food? Go and find that individual social networking and start engaging in the chat with it. During the conversation, type in, oh, I'm out of interest, what's your favourite food? Or in some cases, look on Facebook, the profile, it'll tell you. You go back to Google then, you type in their email address, you type in the answer, the secret food, chocolate in this case. You do an account take it, that's how easy it is. Basic steps of social engineering. But once you're in the Google account, you can see they've been shopping on Amazon because Amazon uses the Google account or the Gmail account for the primary email address you click. If you've got a password there, you get a new password arrived into the Gmail account for their Amazon account. Because the individual saved their credit card on Amazon, you go shopping. But guess what? You don't go shopping for products, you go shopping for the vouchers. Because then you can trade the vouchers online with the currency. That's what happens. So kind of welcome to this virtual world with virtual backdoors. These backdoors are passwords and data that is not encrypted and encryption keys that are stored in software-based systems. We've got a real problem. Why do you think over the past two or three years, or maybe four years, in fact I've been barking on for 15 years, passwords are going to be a major problem? Passwords are so easy to compromise. So we've got this perfect storm brewing here. Yeah? We've got cloud, we've got virtualization, we've got bring your own device. It's all converging. And we've learned nothing at all. What about all those days when in the press the laptop computer left in the back of the taxi and encrypted with personal records on it? Then we thought, well hold on, maybe if we're carrying these mobile devices, laptop computers now, why don't we encrypt it? Why don't we protect it? Now in this virtual world, why should it be any different? We're not encrypting it, we're just putting it up in the room. <coughs> which is great, I endorse it, but we're not doing the basics. So we have all this sensitive data that we know now, and trying to keep track of this data that is an absolute hard <coughs> thing. There is no longer a parameter, it's all about the data. So how do we access the data? We use it with a password. Okay, person logging in, is it the correct person? Is he coming from the correct device? Is it sensitive data? Should it be encrypted? Let me give you an example. How many of you use VM or any type of virtualization? Alright, so let me tell you, let me kind of show you this analogy. I used to be an auditor at Ernst & Young, and one of the things we used to have to check on the audit list, kind of tick the box, was backups. Critical data backups. I followed the process and literally had to check that that backup tape gets picked up by a security guard. It's secured somewhere safe, like in the safe, or it's picked up by a third party security guard. And every week, literally, you would pick up the tape, there'd be someone with you, segregation of duty, someone put the tape in there, close the safe and the safe key would be split between a number of people or the code. In the event of an emergency, disaster recovery, or continuity, that tape would be used, unlocked and backed up. Because it was physical, it was secure. Yeah? But now, that same control, we don't even do it secure now. With VMs, VMs can be copied. Right click, copy. Easy, isn't it? They can be put onto a USB stick. I've even seen it, and I'm sure a number of you do it in the air, where you have a production environment and a test environment. Yes, the test environment is connected to the web in some way or another, or a UAT environment. I've seen organizations, and I'm talking huge brands, take a snapshot of their production environment put it into the UAT environment because they can't be bothered to create dumb data and it's out on the web. I'm 
sure a number of you do it in this room or do it here. It, you cannot control it. Right click copy. It's like when you're at university, I'm not going to go and write an essay, I'm going to go on the web and copy something else. It's, it's so easy. Who's accessing that data? You've got no control of it anymore. So the days of having a safe, backing the data up, have moved. It's gone. You cannot control privilege access. You cannot control who's copying it or who's using it. So we've got a real problem. Multiple instances everywhere. So we've got this data now. So that one piece of data, which is really sensitive, that you have on your iPad using Evernote or Dropbox, is going everywhere. Yeah. I forgot, I forgot myself how many laptops and devices I have Dropbox on. I've got my iPad, I've got my iPhone, I've got four or five laptops here, I've got my computer at home, I've got my wife's computer. I've got Dropbox. And I get confused what boxes I'm dropping what data in, or what photos from the night before or whatever. So it's everywhere now. But I don't think people realise that. So visibility, yeah? Most of my data, you don't know. And even if you are putting the data up into the cloud, do you own that data then? Who owns it? Is it your data? Is it the cloud provider? Think about it. How easy is it to access? Do we only need a password to access that data? I did a documentary three weeks ago for the BBC. They randomly went out and got five <coughs> individuals. And they did a challenge to five individuals with five different methods of attack. The longest attack took me five minutes. Is my data secure? It's in the cloud. Is the cloud provider encrypting it? They may be. But is the encryption key that they're using for your data or for your business? Is that the same key for the other organisations? Because guess what? If one of those organisations gets compromised, you're compromised because they're using the same master key. Yeah? Think about it. So we really, really have to start thinking about basics. Basics are like what is the critical data? What is it we're trying to protect in our business? How are we controlling VMs? Are we using Salesforce or other client services? Because a lot of the organisations you're saying we're not adopting virtualization or we're not using cloud. Trust me, you are without you know. Your accounts department going off now doing their accounts packages online. You've got your sales director now using Salesforce in the cloud. I've seen it where large organizations have gone to the cloud, which is great, I endorse the cloud, it's fantastic. But when their sales teams or sales directors have moved on to another organization, they disabled LDAP and AD. Four months later, they look in Salesforce and the guy's still accessing the data and he's working for a competitor. Yeah? So it's not just like one central system now, it's everywhere. So let's give you some examples. VM, yeah? VM is fantastic. My organization will have a very, very close relationship with VM. Uh, very close together. But just like web servers, and when we all decided to go to the web, we were just putting web servers straight up into the web, no firewalls in front of them, within the DMZ. Yes, a firewall, from my point of view, just doesn't speed up, it just slows the attack down. But it offers a huge amount of protection. So I thought, right, okay, we're in this new era now, virtualization, the cloud. Surely, everything we've learned, no way are people putting VM boxes and hypervisors directly on the web. So I thought, let's just kind of put a script together. Pull the script together uh, using the VM API and you can scan the web. Thousands and thousands of VM servers on the web directly. Directly connected to the web. I was shocked. Absolutely amazed. There could be those UAT test environments with that live data. 
they can be production. Who knows? But the fact that they're directly connected to the web. First of all, I thought, oh, I've seen about 100 or so, then kind of the bandwidths um, increase. I thought, ah, they're honeypots. But no, I did a bit of digging, did a DNS lookup, and some of the names were coming up. They were definitely not under the traps. So I thought, right, okay, I know hackers. I would have forgotten if I was a hacker. How will I get access now? I've got all these web servers connected publicly to the web. How will I do it? It's late at night, kind of being tired. Let's try some simple ways. So let's think about this, right? A hypervisor is a web server, so yeah? All of those basic forms of attack from many years ago when web server attacks were on the right. Let's just try some old fashioned attacks. So, in this case, we had a VM vCenter version 4.1. Uh, and the services that were running were Update Manager, VM Center, Orchestrator, and Chargeback. They're just web services, yeah. So, let's get back and repeat what we know to you know, we discovered over history. Basically, because the actual hypervisor was just on a Windows box, the Windows box itself was default. Meaning, doing some basic attacks, you could actually get root on the box itself. So that's what we did. And the actual administration password for the VM sensor is encrypted, which is great. Using MD5. Which is perfect. This is not VM's problem, okay? This is the individual who has installed the VM sensor by default. And what we're able to do is decrypt the password and gain access to the servers online. Three step approach, yeah? Scan the web, did a compromise against the Windows box itself. From the Windows box, you're underneath the VM application and then you compromise the VM application, basically. It's easy. Has anyone heard of Metasploit? Yeah, for those of you who haven't and are still learning about information security or the way attackers attack, go and download Metasploit, okay? ISO, it's fantastic, okay? A lot of the hackers can use this. It's point and click. You type in the IP address, all the vulnerabilities, and you click the attack. That's the attack for you. Guess what the main types of attacks are then? Privilege access. <coughs> Why is it privilege access? Because to compromise the password is really, really, really simple. And just to show you how simple it is, uh, and again, the attacks I'm going to show you now could be against anything, but in this case it's against the virtual world. Has anyone heard of a pineapple? A <coughs> pineapple you eat or? A pineapple you break Wi Fi password. Okay, fantastic. So this is a pineapple. Um, pretty hard to get hold of at the moment. But, uh, I've been using them these for about four or five years now. Um, it's fantastic. I've got a battery pack connected to this one. I normally have a Coke can, and I normally have a pineapple or a bullet in fact. It gets a bit sticky there. Um, with this, I can pretty much do anything. Um, in fact, I can compromise every single one of you in this room now. I haven't. I'm quite happy to prove you after, but I've done it. The attack I'm going to comp compromise, I'm going to attack myself on my iPad. So, you all have iPads, you all have your mobile phones, you're all kind of hungry to be connected to the web yet. With this, you can install lots of different components and modules. The one I've got enabled at the moment basically tells your devices that is, this is the trusted Wi Fi. So you've got your mobile phones and devices to only connect to known trusted Wi Fi, correct? Yeah. This tells your device it is that trusted Wi Fi. You can't prevent it. That's just one of the many things you can do. I can jam out this whole place, all the other Wi Fi's, and force all of you into this. I can do phishing and phasing attacks. I can do lots of really cool stuff. Okay. 
getting stuck in the line and getting excited. To prove the point, here are some of the devices. I've been playing around in the last session. This is a screenshot. Jason's iPhone, one of my Blackberries, etc. So, at this point, I haven't even conducted the attack. All it's done is force the devices to, to connect to this automatically. I.e., your devices say it's connected to your home or your business network. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Even if you've got it in your handbag or your briefcase, it's connected. So, what do we do now? Now I've forced your devices to connect to me without me knowing I'm in full control. I can do whatever I want. And this is the attack we're going to do. We're going to do an ARP attack, which is impossible to prevent. Essentially a man in the middle attack. And when your devices connect to the Wi-Fi without you knowing, guess what they're doing? All those apps, Dropbox, Google, everything that you're connecting to the cloud, it's communicating, isn't it? And updating. I'm in the middle. I'm collecting all the information. Pretty easy. So, to prove the point, let's do it. This is where it gets a bit worrying. So, the tool we're going to use, because it's very visual, um, normally I would use a, a Linux box, um, but this tool is called Kane Enable, okay? Um, again, go and download it, um, play with it, learn how these tools work. Uh, this tool has a number of things built into it. It has a cracker, so if the password or any of the traffic is actually encrypted, it will be encrypted pretty quickly. Um, it has some Wi-Fi cracking tools in it as well, and it also has the sniffer. So this is some of the traffic that is uh, capturing already. So you can see LinkedIn, Google, the BBC website, Yahoo, Etc. So everything that is going on at the moment. And here's my device here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to start surfing the web. I'm going to start downloading some emails. I've got a dummy, um, well not a dummy, I've got a real web account set up. And hopefully, if this works, it will capture my password. So I'm just, I don't know if you can see. Just download the emails now. If I get to the sniffer, if I get to the passwords, the username and the password. That's how easy it is. So any of your devices, I can go to target because they will connect to this. I select the device, I run K and enable, and it will sniff the traffic. Guess what? If the traffic is encrypted, I go to the ARP side of it, and it will also pick up all the encrypted traffic, and then I import it into the cracker and it will decrypt it. That's how easy it is. So, virtual world, virtual data, data is everywhere. It's not even your data when you're connecting to it. How do you start securing it? How vulnerable could you be with your organisation to be? How many of you use drop? Some of you, okay. Um, I'm not actually going to do this one because it does bring up some kind of interesting results. Um, but many, many years ago, I um, wrote a book on Google Hacking. It was just kind of the early days of what kind of information security was looking off. Google collates everything without you even knowing, okay? Um, and if you type certain commands into Google, you can extract some really interesting information. So in this case, if you were to type in that particular URL at the top, you would actually pull up cached Dropbox documents. All right? Freely available. You pass the authorization to service. In this case, um, we're going to go with Dropbox has something called galleries. So any photos you take on your device are uploads to the galleries. We will do this one because it's kind of cool. Um, if I click on it and run the attack, there you go. So now you have people's Dropboxes, in this case, 
just go straight into his Dropbox uh, the same. Okay, I understand the risk. It's just I accept it. Confirm. And that will, all the photos of that individual will now appear. Okay, fine. I'm getting there. But you get my point. Yeah. Services, data is going anywhere, and they're actually looking at that appropriately. Let's try that one. I want to prove the point. Let's try this one straight. Uh, let's try that one. Right, so it's happening on this one. Google Docs, I'm not going to do this one, um, but does anyone know what enable password is? No? Probably kind of new security. Anyone do Cisco here? Anyone understand? Play with Cisco? Enable password is the administration password, the, the key password for Cisco devices. In text enable passwords in Google, you'd be amazed how many people are storing a list of passwords, enable passwords. In Google. So you use Google Docs to secure or to store passwords. Do a command on that and you'll be amazed at the company names as well. So, the bottom line attacks are on the increase, okay? We're actually making it easier for attackers to, to compromise our businesses. We don't really need to be if we start thinking about the basics. Confidentiality, integrity, availability, accountability, and responsibility. We're in this era now where it's about data again. Let's start thinking about the security of data. You know, I've got this concept which I'll talk in a bit more detail in a minute secure breach. Wouldn't it be great to say to your board members or your CISO or your CTA, boss, don't worry, we've been breached? <laughs> However, it was a secure breach. Yeah. I was with a, a very, very large US organization two years ago. And I just came up with this concept, secure breach. It would be great. Also, I've been hacked. Don't worry, it's secure. So, and that's by encrypting the data. Start thinking about how you're protecting the data. Because you protect that one piece of data, if it goes from here, to here it's still protected, but it doesn't really matter. Alright, so remember secure breach. <coughs> also, it's not the job of the cloud or the infrastructure as a service or the virtual service provider to be protecting your data. In most cases, they provide you the, the availability, they provide you with an SLA. Yeah? You take AWS here, yeah? amazing service. They have other elements and components where you own the key. Yeah? But it's up to you to enable that. So it's your key that's encrypted the data. You know, they have the data centers of service. It's great. So it's your responsibility. People just think by connecting to the virtual world or creating virtual environments that it's secure. It's not. You still need to put a layer of security on it. And this is what a lot of people are forgetting. This is a pretty cool tool, just to show you how easy it is to go out and get encryption keys. Does everyone know what a key is? Sorry? Okay, right, so, yes, correct. So, in virtual, in the virtual world of cloud services, okay, there's a key, alright? So each organisation, when they are saving data and storing data, they have a unique key. That key is created by a master key. Alright? 
But these keys, unless they're secured appropriately, can be targeted. So initially, the key is used to unlock the data or decrypt the data. Yeah? So if that key is not adequately protected, I can just go and grab that key and unlock your data. All right? So I can do some of the attacks I've showed you. It may be initially encrypted, but if I get the key, I can just unlock it. So it's like PKI essentially, yeah? I've got this different account this data for data. Alright? So it's what a key is. The problem is people are not storing the key appropriately. Because they just think, well, it's a key, it's, it's, it's safe. So when they're logging into virtual environments in the cloud, in some cases, that key is being cached. So what we can do now, we can use tools like this and actually go and grab those keys. Not only that, when we grab the keys, it tells us the organization that the data is for. And to show you that tool, I'm not going to do this because it brings up some pretty scary results. This is the tool. All I do is type in the query there. Do I want a company? Do I want a particular uh, query? And it goes off. And so does Google. Who save me doing it manually? And it brings up all the keys and the outputs. Also, you can search for other kind of malware keys, uh, Bing. You can do some pretty cool stuff with this. DLP. Yeah, let's just click it right up. If I go on code search, cloud hacking. I'm not going to drop down because it shows some interesting things. But now it's cloud hacking. Yeah? And it's click, click, click. So what's it after? Passwords and encryption keys. Because people think, well, hold on, data's up in the, up in the cloud or it's in the virtual world. A static password is protecting the access. And then a key, software key, is encrypting them. So if we compromise the password, doesn't matter if it's 30, if it changes every 30, 60, 90 days. Just gives them an attacker 30, 60, 90 days to gain access to it or capture it. And as you've seen in the example, it takes seconds. Once he's in, he's in. Once he's in, the individual, the owner of the data thinks that doesn't matter because the data is encrypted. Well, no, because I can go and get the keys, software keys, because they're not stored appropriately or encrypted appropriately and decrypt the data. It's pretty easy, yeah. Kind of evolves from there, really. I think you're starting to get, to get the point. We have a virtual world in our business lives, and in our personal lives, we're using Facebook, Flickr, all these other online accounts. And we're kind of getting this hybrid, this pollination. Yeah? If an individual is compromised personally, the likelihood of their organization will be compromised as well. So, you've got a real problem, okay? battle for the virtual world has begun, but I make it sound very, very bad. It can be very, very easy, yeah? We just need to remember some of the basics. Confidential
Energy and IT, who's accessing the data? Integrity. Is that data true? The availability, that's kind of dealt with now by virtualization. Accountability and awardability. Can you prove that Joe Bloggs accessed that data and wasn't here? So we kind of need to change our mindset, okay? It's not if you're going to be hacked, it's when you're going to be hacked. And why do you think there's so many phishing and phasing attacks now? Or methods to try and get your password? It's because if I have your password, I'm invisible in your organisation. The firewalls, access control, it's all designed to say, is Jason Jason? Is that the right password? I'm invisible then in your network. I was reading an interesting stat. Um, has anyone read the recent Horizon report? Security breach? It's fascinating. 66% um, of breaches were password related. Of the 66% of the password related attacks, 54 percent were not identified that they'd be compromised within four months. So it took them four months to realise the attack was in their network for a valid password. The remainder percentage, which was 10 percent, over a year. But that's the ones that are aware, you know, they, they, they were doing an audit or they had to lock down accounts or whatever. Or that individual was lost. How many of you would know if an attacker was in your organisation and they were using a valid password? How many of you look at the multiple login attacks? Just like the example I gave you earlier on about the National Health Service. Five other individuals using the same username and password in the network. They couldn't prove it. They were saying. So we really, really have to eradicate. Passwords. It's pretty easy to do that. Get rid of the static password and replace it with a one-time password. It's simple, it's easy, cost efficient now. Ten years ago it was really hard to monetize authentication now. So you are going to be breached. Make sure you tell your boss and make sure you save your job by saying, boss, we've been breached, but guess what? It was a secure breach. Okay? Wouldn't that be great PR? In front of the, uh, the news, XYZ company have been hacked. Don't worry, it was secure. It's going to be done. So let's kind of sum up here, yeah? And we'll do this in some secure way. Secure the bridge, yeah? Very simple. Encrypt data, or as I say, can I say this over here? Encrypt shit, yeah? It's encrypted. Implement the basics, yeah? Confidentiality, CIA, integrity, availability. And then if by doing that, you get accountability and you get more visibility. Remember, static passwords are really, really weak. Doesn't matter if they're encrypted, they can be decrypted. They can be socially engineered. You know, what really annoys the heck out of me is when I read press articles and read security guides saying, make sure, and we'll log onto a website, make sure your password is 16 characters long, alphanumeric, and you're going to forget it, yeah? But if it's compromised, is it going to clear anyone? So it doesn't really matter how long and complicated it is. It doesn't prevent anything. Replace it with a one-time password. And then finally, key management, yeah? If you're taking a cloud service or any virtual Data. Make sure you own the key, not the cloud provider. Make sure the key that's protecting your data is unique to your organisation. Yeah. And you should start asking your cloud providers that exact question. Thank you. Any questions? Where do you get your presentation from? Sorry. Presentation not online. How can you get a copy? It's not online. I'll give you a copy right after.
actually control um, what uh, hypervisors that they connect to. So yes, that's very, very simple to do. No, it's, it's not part of the hypervisor. Uh, I can talk to you about 